on? I'm always on. Yes. Yes. Let me do the announcements before I just, well, we got two minutes and they finished early beautifully. Thank you, everyone, your beautiful musicianship. But it is a blessed Easter this morning. Some of you were smart. You stayed home till this service. It was raining in the morning. And so Jesus had to dance in the rain. So you guys are lucky. You don't have to dance in the rain today, but that's all right. It was beautiful this morning. Uh, it's a blessed Easter day. Just brief announcements, and here they are. Read your announcements. Ta-da! Uh, and um, I got I have to. Sue, President Sue, anything you want to share? Yes, no? Nothing. Nothing? Okay, all right. So it, they're, they're all in your announcements, the, all, this, all this stuff there. A special thank you to all those that made the breakfast and the hard work and the meal and all that stuff coming in. And of course, there is nothing more fabulous than this absolutely gorgeous resurrection cross with all the beautiful, beautiful flowers. Um, a reminder of really what this holy day of love is all about. Death is conquered. From death comes new life and then the beauty of all those flowers. Which reminds me, if you have one of these beautiful Easter lilies, I have been reminded, please take them after worship, okay? A gift from us to you, even though you paid for it. So take it and enjoy it, because they haven't, not all of them have blossomed, and there's nothing more beautiful than anticipating and waiting for them to open up. Some have already, so please do that. I do have one announcement. Life is always an incredible journey. We, we uh, know that each day is all we have, this moment. And this moment, I was told that Howard and Janelle Johnson are celebrating 68 years of marital bliss. <laughs> Janelle's applauding and Howard's going, huh, what? No, I'm kidding. It is a beacon of love that we are given throughout life, different things, and to, to your blessed 68 years, may God continue to grant you your love story and your light shining brightly to all of us. We give thanks and praise for your blessings and for your presence this day, uh, and it happens to be Easter, so God's blessings on you. With that, let us not delay. Let us not delay. Welcome, everybody. As we move into uh, worshiping our Lord... What? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, 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 I'll get there. I'll get... <laughs> that, when you say, Pastor, the delay is, yes, for the kids. Yes, the kids found eggs, but they also, this, this Lent, we were on the journey of practicing the pause, and they were given their boxes of collecting money. I mean, it, it starts young. It should start young. We should start in encouraging our children in our own lives of generosity and this day is, if it's anything, is a day of incredible generosity for our God. So all the kids who have their little boxes of money that's got my name on it, I, that actually got God's name on it, come on up, bring your box up here, come on up, gather around the baptismal font. This isn't a blessing of the money, this is really a blessing of stewardship of these kids. Look at that. Let me see one of this. It's, it says... Feed the world. Oh, oh well, no, yo, you, you want to hold that for yourself? No? Okay. Hey, it sounds like you bought candy in here. No, oh, oh, okay. Hold on. Now, you hold on to that for now. Hold on to it. Okay. For, for all of us, you know, we, we, we as adults and grandparents, etc. if you wonder why the church struggles, it struggles because we keep our mouths shut and we don't say anything to our grandkids, to our children, to life itself. This is a part of the blessing of what it means to know God and his love, is to watch it spread. And these kids will be the next generation that will share the good news of Jesus and his love for all. So to all of you kids, that you took the time and thought about it, and I hope that you did as you put money in there, feeding the hungry and the poor, this is what Jesus is telling us this day. Even though death is no longer something we need to be afraid of, what he told us in following him was to love him by loving others, which means feeding those in the world that can't help themselves. So your generous offerings will help in that journey. So let's pray. Gracious and loving God, through these young hands, we give you thanks and praise. Another generation that hears the call of love 
and responds in kind. Bless this offering that it may fulfill the needs of what it says on the box that we feed the poor in our midst. Bless them, bless their continued journey. In your holy name we pray, amen. Okay, why don't you just set it right up here, uh, right by the, uh, the plants there. On the ground. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And you thought I forgot, Megan. Huh. Thank you for reminding me. Okay. <laughs> Let us turn our hearts and minds to Almighty God this Easter morning. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ lives. Christ lives indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, Paul writes. Today, Christ is risen, and we gather together with astonishment and joy. Christ is risen, and we have been set free from the bonds of death. Christ is risen, and we are forgiven. Christ is risen, and with the women at the tomb and Peter, we are amazed. Let us rejoice. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. And now you have to arise. Please rise as you are able.
waters of baptism, we have passed over from death to life with Christ. And we are a new creation for this saving mystery and for this water. Let us bless God who was, who is, and who is to come. Now breathe upon this water and awaken your church once more. Claim us again as your beloved and holy people. Quench our thirst, cleanse our hearts, wipe away every tear. To you, our beginning and our end, our shepherd and our lamb, be honor, glory, praise, and thanksgiving now and forever. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, God, you gave you your only Son, Son to suffer death, death on the cross for our redemption. And by his glorious resurrection, you delivered us from the power of death. Make us die every day to sin, that we may live with him forever in the joy of the resurrection. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated, everyone. The first reading is from Acts, the 10th chapter, beginning with the 34th verse. Peter crosses the sharp religious boundaries separating Jews and Gentiles and proclaims the good news of God's inclusive forgiveness in Jesus' name to Cornelius, a Roman centurion. As a result of Peter's preaching, Cornelius and his family become the first Gentiles to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. The reading. Peter began to speak to the people. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Rejoice and praise Him, Alleluia. 
second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, beginning at the first verse. The core of the Christian faith and Paul's preceding is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As the crucified and risen Christ appeared to the earliest of his followers, so we experience the presence of the risen one in the preachings of this faith. The reading. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which you also stand, through which you also are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed unto you as a first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Word of God, word of life. <coughs> sing it. <laughs> the resurrection of Jesus is announced, and the response is one of terror and amazement. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 16th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples 
and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Breathe in, breathe out. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. This is the closing line of what I just read in Mark's gospel. I know Mark's version isn't the most popular one. My goodness, heaven forbid, it doesn't do much. Most of us prefer John's gospel, which we did at the early service, with its poignant portrayal of Mary Magdalene mistaking Jesus for a gardener, clinging to him when he speaks his, her name. John's version gives us tension and drama, the rash and headstrong Peter running, uh, not as fast as John who gets there first, but he bolts by him, goes right in there. The apostle who loved Jesus, peeking cautiously into the empty tomb, and the risen Jesus himself commissioning Mary to become an apostle to the apostles who shares the staggering news of the resurrection with their scattered friends. And what do we get? In contrast, on this day, 2024, March 31st, Mark's version. Very disquieting, isn't it? We get no glimpse of the risen Jesus. Peter and the other disciples are nowhere to be seen. When a young man in a white robe tells Mary Magdalene and her two companions that Jesus has been raised from the dead, the women don't cry and out in joy. They respond with alarm, terror. They are absolutely afraid. Maybe some amazement. The announcement by the angel, the good news inspires neither belief nor transformation, brothers and sisters. We witness no Easter proclamation, no narrative arc from hopelessness to certitude. Instead, we, win we witness fear, flight, and silence. And this, this is familiar. This really, truly is the original gospel. You know, this week we celebrate Easter, the high point of our liturgical year, but given the ongoing struggles in our global village, the ongoing wars, the ongoing war with COVID, over 7 million people dead because of it, the ongoing struggle with a division in our own particular uh, country, food insecurity, uh, a deepening crisis in loneliness and depression and anxiety, like I said a week ago, you stick your nose in your phones and people have, oh, look at all my friends, but nobody seems to understand. It's a false sense of security. They aren't your friends. They aren't hearkening unto you and calling out your name as somehow glorious. And we wonder why people are so depressed and alone today. The, the, the seeming endless sense of violence in our nation and an unwillingness for politicians to correct it through legislation that puts a hamper on the use of guns. God forbid we would do something like that. You know, about the only thing going well in this country is greed. It's doing well. The market is just booming. Economically, we are at a best place, contrary to the voices of those who say, I'm worse off than I was four years ago. No, you're not. We just get that all the time. And oh, yes, on top of that, lest I forget, you all know it, it is a presidential election year. The worst year for any preachers at all. We have to stand in the pulpit and everyone accuses us of proclaiming political statements, which really is coming out of scripture. What does that tell us, huh? Jesus was highly political. So in all that, how do we go about proclaiming Christ is risen, he is risen indeed? Well, this year, during our Lenten journey, as I've reflected on the practice of the pause during this season, I've been struck again and again by the enormity of humanity and what we've endured and what we continue to endure. We witnessed 
and sustain losses on a scale barely begun to register, much less to grieve. Let's be honest, there are a lot of empty tables, a lot of empty chairs at the tables of people that we love in this big village of ours called the world. We're weary, we're numb, we're bewildered, we're sad. We hear what the angel at the tomb is saying to us, and in some deep recesses of our souls, we know that the angel's words are the most consequential words we've ever heard, but we are trembling in alarm, and we're still trying not to flee. Maybe what we need this Easter is Mark's version of the story, what we're getting. I think we do. Maybe we need time to practice the pause as the women in Mark's account needed time to sit with the terror and the amazement that must fall upon us when God's incomprehensible work of redemption collides in real time with the broken bewilderment of our lives. I mean, after all, I don't believe in God. How could God do this to me, to my wife, to my child? We always hear that. Pain and suffering is the excuse for not believing in God instead of understanding that pain and suffering and struggle is exactly where God meets us and uses us for the sake of redemption. Maybe we don't need to shout right away. Maybe it's okay to whisper. Maybe we should simply just practice the pause, practice some silence for once in our life where the noise is just cacophonous. This year I'm allowing myself a slow Easter, an Easter that takes root within me as imperceptibly as seeds break into life beneath the earth. Anyone who grows green things knows that the process of transformation is hidden from our eyes. All you farmers out there or people who know farmers or who if you grew up on a farm every spring, it's shrouded in mystery, isn't it? You go to, you know, driving down those, you grade up the soil and you plant the seed and you wonder, what will happen? Farmers are the most faithful people. They know what's going to happen. It's shrouded in that mystery. It has a timeline of its own and we we tremble at seeming fragility. Surely this can't be, but it is yet. And yet the tender shoots break through the soil and new life emerges every time. Unless you're in North and South Dakota where you got a drought or some other crud that goes on. It never amazes me how our Scandinavian and German relatives decided to go land that more than not doesn't always produce that well in lousy weather. But nonetheless, it's there. And if if it's right, every time that seed comes through. Likewise, I believe that there is life we cannot see, the life of God hidden within us. The impatience we have because we can't shut our mouths and we can't turn off our phones and we can't listen within. To God, tenacious, dynamic, and sure. It might take some time to emerge and flourish, but the life itself is certain. It's in there and God's in there. Every gospel account of the resurrection tells us that the most important event in the history happened in total darkness. Sometime in the pre-dawn hours of a Sunday morning 2,000-odd years ago, a great mystery triumphed in secret. No sunlight illuminated the event. No human being witnessed it. And even now, centuries later, no human narrative can contain it. There isn't a preacher that can even get close. Matter of fact, my words are in the way of just sitting here quietly reflecting on the beauty of new life. The resurrection exceeds all our attempts to pin it down because it's a mystery known only to God. Whatever the raising was and is, its fullness lies in holy darkness shielded from our eyes. All we can know is that somehow in an ancient tomb, On a starry night, God worked in secret to bring life out of death. Somehow, somehow, from the heart of loss and misery, God enacted salvation. What I really respect about Mark's version of the story is that it honors this mystery. 
text doesn't lead to quick explanation. That's what pastors and theologians and historians and all those people, theology, to prove, to do all those kind of stuff to bring people to a sense of joy. It allows bewilderment of the first witness to be exactly what it is. The narrative doesn't rehabilitate us. So often I wish that we, the church, could be patient, so nuanced, so attuned to spiritual and psychological reality that when we speak and share our good news, we speak from an internal wisdom. Wouldn't our witness be so much more credible if we didn't feel the need to rush to resurrection? I know, I know, I know. This is Easter. We want the best music. We want the, the beautiful hymns. We want to go out of those doors filled with joy. God forbid, Pastor, what the hell are you doing to us? You're making us think. Oh, I'm sorry about that. It isn't about you. It's about me reflecting on my own struggle here to understand this incredible gift that we have been given. I think our witness would be more credible if we didn't feel the need to rush to it so quickly. You ever go to a three-year-old's birthday party? Anybody? I've been to them. I've got grandkids. What's the one thing they want to rush to? You better believe it. All us over 65, what's the one thing we want to do at our birthday besides drink? Rush to the presents. Uh, no, we all want to rush to the present. We want the goodies. That's, that's human, right? Can't help it. We want to slap smiles and bows on the wounds of the world. Sometimes when human beings are, pro, are in profound pain, good news hurts, brothers and sisters. We find it too jarring, too dissonant, too grating. We can't map it. We can't bridge it. We can't wrap language around it. We literally can't take it into our bodies. Something tender and essential within us resists. At such moments, maybe the most faithful response to the seeming disconnect between Christ's resurrection and our continuing pain is a reverent silence. Practicing the pause. Tuning into the still, small voice, God within. Imago Dei, we are created in the image of God. God dwells within us and speaks to us. We just got to shut up and listen. The, woman, the women at the tomb waited before they spoke. They led with wounded awe, not premature consolation. They practiced the pause. I wonder if we shy away from Mark's gospel because we don't trust the story itself to do its work. What do you think? We feel some pious need to protect and embellish it. But isn't the really good news this, that the truth of the resurrection doesn't depend on the religious performance of the spiritual stanima, stanima of, of us failing human beings, that it doesn't really depend on us at all? It doesn't matter one bit if we believe on the spot or not. The tomb's empty, brothers and sisters. Death is vanquished. Jesus lives, period. We are not in charge of Easter. Guess who is? God is. Maybe that's really the rub. We want to be in charge of Easter in every event in our life. You know, I'm grateful that the Scriptures preserve the gap between God's all-sufficient work and our tenuous apprehension of it. This is what being human is all about, the struggle. I believe most of the time, but not all the time, the good that I do, I don't want to do, and the evil I don't want to do, I end up doing. Paul had it right on. The psychology was there. We are like that. Absolutely. I am so grateful that I cling to the resurrection, but I don't know what to do with death's ongoing cruelty. Pastors know what that's all about. Nurses know what's all that. Doctors know when we live and work in an arena of death all the time. You are constantly bombarded with that struggle in your life. What does it mean? What does it mean? I get the promise, but it seems so cruel. I trust that Jesus reigns, but I don't comprehend the elusive nature of the kingdom. 
I believe that all things will be well, but I don't understand why they're not all well now. Because God's in charge of Easter, not us. St. Anselm of Canterbury's motto for the Christian life was faith-seeking understanding. Maybe that's really what we need to be about. I like that. Often it's only in retrospect, only as I look back at the gravesides of my life, that I see how God has opened my heart to understanding. The poet R.S. Thomas in his poem, The Answer, puts it this way, There has been times when after long on my knees in a cold chancel, a stone has rolled from my mind, and I have looked and in and seen the old questions lie, folded and in a place by themselves, like the piled gravestones of love's risen body. Brothers and sisters, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who is crucified. He has been raised. He's not here. Look, this is the place that they laid him. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? All that has been taken so cruelly will be restored. Christ is risen. The grave is empty. Love is eternal and death's defeat is sure. Nothing, nothing will be lost. Whether or not you can hear and bear this great truth right now doesn't matter. Christ has given it to you. It is yours. Christ is alive. Death has been conquered. That, brothers and sisters, the gift of love is what Easter is all about. How about you practice the pause and you go home after today before you start the meal and all the hubbub of what Easter is all about? And just sit, reflect, hold hands, and celebrate this gift of love and life. And remember all those that we love that are not with us now but are in eternity, reminding us of we too shall come that way as well. The shoulders we stand on, those who have gone before. May this day be a slow day of celebrating the empty tomb. Amen. <laughs> I'm dropping everything. All right. With joy, let us celebrate it together and affirm our faith and the faith of our church. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. Holy God, we pray for the body of Christ, the church, where the church is persecuted, protect it. Where the church is privileged, grant it humility. Where the church is fractured, heal it. Guide us all to embody Christ's love in the world. God of grace, hear our prayer. Living God, we pray for the earth, your, your good creation. Join our prayers with branches lifted in praise and roaring waters of new life that together we may proclaim Easter's hope. God of grace, Merciful God, we pray for all peoples and nations, free oppressed communities from occupation, 
exploitation and abuse. Teach leaders your way of justice. Empower peacemakers and all who work to end violence and strife. God of grace, hear our prayer. Liberating God, we pray for people everywhere who long for good news. Roll away the stones that keep people from living with dignity and wholeness. Breathe new life and hope into people struggling to make it through each day. God of grace, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for this community of faith. At this time, we lift up people that we love and know and remember in silence of our heart. for your spirit in our midst. Feed us at your Easter table and fill us with your wisdom that we may serve and care for others. God of grace, hear our prayer. prayer. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Risen one, 
you call us to believe and bear fruit. May the gifts that we offer here be signs of your abiding love. Form us to be your witnesses in the world through Jesus Christ, our true vine. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord and Savior took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me, the body of Christ. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me, the blood of Christ. Remembering his love for us on the way at the table and to the end, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Please rise as you are able and let us pray that prayer our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. The risen Christ is made known to us in the breaking of the bread. Come and eat at God's table.
The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Shepherding God, you have prepared a table before us and nourished us with your love. Send us forth from this banquet to proclaim your goodness and share the abundant mercy of Jesus, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. Receive the benediction, brothers and sisters. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. The God of resurrection power, the Christ of unending joy, and the spirit of Easter hope bless you now and always. Amen. Amen. Please rise for our closing hymn. dismissal uh, to the brass this day. Thank you for really pepping it up for us. There's nothing greater than, you know, a quintet of brass instruments playing and just opening our hearts to the power of God through music. So thank you very much. You made this day beautiful. And as Malloy always says, the checks are in the mail. All right. <laughs> I'm kidding. Hallelujah. Go in peace. Rejoice and be glad. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. To God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Practice the pause, brothers and sisters.
Yes. Nicely okay, done, thank Brad. you so much. There's an egg. Yes. You have it. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you.